This is part six of Defects and Strength, topic four in Materials Engineering Mate 210. So going back to our big picture, we've been talking a lot about crystalline defects. And there are a number of kinds of crystalline defects that exist. We're going to be talking about impurities, which are individual atoms that do not belong in the crystal, dislocations or extra planes of atoms that don't belong in the crystal, grain boundaries, which are surfaces of disorder between two crystals of different orientation, and second phases, when you have a different way of organizing matter in three-dimensional space embedded within yet another way of organizing matter. Each of these different defects can contribute to the properties of the material, particularly in the case of metals. <clears throat> First of all, we need to understand the most basic type of defect found in crystals, and that's a vacancy. A vacancy is a position in the lattice where an atom that is supposed to exist is missing. This is not the same as an interstitial site. Interstitial sites are openings that exist naturally within the crystal and are part of the crystalline structure. A vacancy is a defect or mistake where an entire atom has gone missing. Typically vacancies form during solidification when we take a metal and turn it from a liquid state into the solid state. They can also happen from normal vibrations of atoms within the crystals. The typical atom vibrates at about 10 to the 13th hertz. That's pretty high. And every time it vibrates, there's a certain probability that it will jump out of that lattice position and escape, leaving behind a vacancy position. <coughs> Sometimes these vacancies can be filled by atoms that don't belong there. These are called substitutional impurity atoms. And even in the purest of materials that we have, such as ultra-pure silicon, there can still be trillions of impurity atoms in a very small amount of silicon. In fact, impurity atoms are impossible to get rid of. We even use impurity atoms to figure out where specific materials come from in the world, based on their own local chemistry and, and geography, uh, geology. We can also put impurity atoms in the interstitial sites, but in this case, the interstitial atom has to be very, very small in order to occupy that small site. So substitutional impurity atoms are typically about the same size as the host atom, and interstitial atoms are much smaller than the host atoms. <coughs> Another type of defect we're going to run into are grain boundaries and interfaces. Recall that grain boundaries are regions between crystals of different orientation, where there is a high level of disorder at the, inter at the interface between the two different crystals. We talked about a cartoon example where the grain consists of atoms lined up along a particular orientation being different from the, grain, the atoms in a different grain. And we looked at a picture of actual grains and their grain boundaries surrounding the grains. So the grain boundary isn't really a thing, it's just a defect or a mistake in the crystal as far as any one grain is concerned. <coughs> a new type of defect is called an interface. And this is a boundary between two different types of crystals, or two different ways of organizing matter. It can even be a boundary between a crystalline material and an amorphous material. And then there's a final type of defect called the exposed surface, such as between a metal and the surrounding air. And this is also a defect, and the reason that corrosion happens at the surface, because the defect has higher energy than the interior of the metal. Okay, so that's some of the defects we've talked about. And don't forget, we've also talked about dislocations quite a bit. So that's another type of defects. <clears throat> Let's also talk about how these defects can help us if we use them in the right way. So looking back at the stress-strain diagram, remember that on the x-axis you have strain, on the y-axis you have stress, there's a linear portion of the curve that represents that it's the elastic region, and then we have the nonlinear portion of the curve that represents the plastic deformation. Now keep in mind the yield strength, or the point of beginning of plastic deformation, is defined by the 0.2% offset method. So if our goal was to increase the strength of the material, we'd want to shift this point further up. Well, in order to do that, we have to shift up the point of first nonlinearity, or the proportional limit. This is the point at which dislocation begin, movement begins. So in other words, we have to find a way to make it more difficult to move dislocations. This means more resistance to slip, which would lead to increased yield strength. So bottom line is, all of these defects increase the strength of metals by making it harder for dislocations to move. And we'll look at each one in detail and see just exactly why it gets harder for a dislocation to move based on the different defects. <clears throat> 
Well, in this part, we're going to look at the first two types of defects, dislocations and grain boundaries. Now, this, these lead to the two different mechanisms, one strain hardening, the other grain size reduction strengthening, that occur in all metals, even pure metals, can undergo these kinds of strengthening mechanisms. And together, these mechanisms can cause an increase in strength, but as with all all things, when we increase strength, we tend to decrease the ductility and the material becomes more brittle. All right, let's look first at strengthening mechanism number one, strain hardening. Let's imagine we have a grain where all the atoms are lined up in the same orientation. And within that grain are two dislocations traveling along different planes in different directions. But there comes a point where they interact with one another. At that point of interaction, there's a repulsive interaction between the dislocations, which increases the amount of work needed to keep the dislocations moving. If the dislocations can't move, then there's no plastic deformation. And if there's no plastic deformation, then we can say that the strength has increased. So here's a picture of a heavily deformed piece of brass. And you can see all the slip lines running through that brass. <clears throat> There are going to be places where these dislocations intersect one another and bump into each other and repel. And that means that that grain of brass is now stronger than it was before we had the plastic deformation. This is what we mean by strain hardening. If I create plastic strain, the metal actually gets stronger or harder. Now why would two dislocations repel? Well, the answer has to do with the nature of the dislocation and the way it causes distortion in the lattice surrounding the dislocation. If we imagine this is the dislocation, and this line here represents the extra half plane of atoms, and on the same plane I have another dislocation with its extra half plane above the slip plane, as they approach each other, you'll get two compressive strain fields located around that extra half plane of atoms that begin to interact. As they interact, they repel each other, because the crystal doesn't want the atomic bonds to be compressed too much. Remember that when atoms are in compression, as they would be because of the extra half plane of atoms, the <clears throat> repulsive forces will go up dramatically if we look at the energy curve for two atoms bonded together. So for this reason, when two dislocations come into contact with each other with the same orientation, they tend to repel. Now if they had exactly the opposite orientation, they would actually annihilate one another, and you'd end up with an extra plane of atoms that's complete and no defect. But this is very unlikely, and it's much more common that the two dislocations will actually not line up properly and would repel each other. So what does strain hardening do to the properties of materials? Well, it depends a lot on the material, but in almost all metals, it tends to increase the strength of the metal. So let's take copper, for example. The strength of copper is increased almost three times by plastic deformation. And the measurement we're using for plastic deformation is called percent cold work. And what that means is it's the change in area of an object. So imagine we took a wire that was a half an inch in diameter and we drew it down to a quarter inch in diameter. That would be a 50% reduction in area and therefore 50% cold work change. Well, not quite 50% reduction in area, but you get the point. If I took brass, I see a... 100% increase in strength, and in the case of steel, I see almost a, almost 100% a increase in strength. A large increase, but it started out with a large strength to begin with. This is why we cold work metals before they're used in application in order to give them the high strength they need for that application. But notice what happens to the ductility of these materials. Steel, copper, and brass all lose their ductility, and all three of them drop below 10% ductility when they get out to about 30% cold work or higher. That means that these metals would be unusable for most engineering applications because engineer designers stay away from metals with ductilities less than about 10%. Now, it's possible to deform a metal, like drawing that copper wire, down to a smaller size, but not increase the strength. But to do this, you have to use a special heat treatment called annealing. Now, annealing causes a mechanism to occur inside the metal called recrystallization. And in the recrystallization process, the old cold worked grains, seen here in the picture on the upper left, are gradually turned into grains, small grains, with very few dislocations seen in the lower right. 
So if I show you what happens over time, first we start out with grains that are heavily deformed, but big grains. After a period of time, shown by the red arrow, small grains begin to nucleate or form along the heavy slip lines. You can see the little splotches. After a longer period of time at temperature, the large grains begin to disappear and are replaced by smaller grains. And eventually you have complete recrystallization where the large grains are completely eliminated and we only have small grains left behind. You actually do this in Mate 215 when you roll the brass and then stick it in the furnace and it gets softer. The reason it gets softer is because the grains have recrystallized. Without with the recrystallized grains, we no longer have as many dislocations and therefore not as many interactions between two dislocations, so the strength goes back down. It's the reverse of strain hardening. Let's look at a second strengthening mechanism, grain size reduction strengthening. This also works for pure metals, but it also works in alloys as well. The idea is, is that if I have two grains with different orientations, they'll gradually run into each other at the the dislocation, excuse me, will be traveling along through one grain and will eventually run into the grain boundary between the two grains. Now when it hits that grain boundary, it has two problems. The first problem is, is that the orientation of the crystal has changed. So it may slow down or possibly speed up depending on the direction the stress is applied relative to that slip plane. We don't know, so it could go either way. The more important problem that the dislocation has is that the grain boundary itself is an area of disorder the atoms don't line up perfectly and in order for a dislocation to move properly it has to be moving through a perfect crystal otherwise it gets slowed down or stopped completely <clears throat> therefore it takes more stress to push a dislocation across this boundary than if the boundary weren't there so as dislocations run into grain boundaries the metal appears to get stronger because it requires more stress to keep the plastic deformation going Here's a picture from a transmission electron microscope showing dislocations stacked up parallel to each other as they approach a grain boundary. You can see the reason they're stacked up parallel is because they're traveling on the same slip plane. And you'll also notice that they stack up more tightly near the grain boundary than they do far away from the grain boundary. And the reason for that is, is that as we continue to apply stress, we're putting more and more pressure on the dislocations down here near the grain boundary to stack up so they move closer and closer. And as they move away, there's less stress on the dislocations far away, so they tend to be spread out more. Now this problem called the dislocation pileup can be so bad that you can actually create a crack at the grain boundary, which can then lead to failure of the, the part mechanically. So here's a question for you to think about on your own. Let's say you have these two microstructures. The one on the left has grains that are approximately 50 microns in diameter. The one on the right has grains that are approximately 50 nanometers on diameter. Remember, a nanometer is one one-thousandth of a micrometer. Which of these two grains do you think would be stronger? If you said the nickel would be stronger, you're right. Because the grains are so much smaller, the dislocations will only be able to travel a very small distance, about 50 nanometers, before they run into a grain boundary and that grain boundary will make it difficult for the dislocation to continue moving. Whereas in the large grains of the aluminum sample, the dislocation can travel a long distance, allowing for a lot of plastic deformation prior to resistance from the grain boundary. So the aluminum material will appear to be weaker, but will also be more ductile than the ultrafine.